Oh, yeah. All right, here we go with our meditation today. I'm so you get me chatting and talking to you. Just, you know, the, grace, the grace of the cross. Now, this sounds like a good one. Steve doesn't need one if he does he's got all this stuff in our eyes. <laughs> all right, this morning's meditation, the grace of the cross from the Valley of Vision. So if someone will kindly read this and we'll open the floor for discussion. The grace of the cross. <clears throat> oh my savior, I thank thee from the depths of my being, from thy wondrous grace and love, for thy wondrous grace and love, in bearing my sin in thine own body on the tree. May the cross be to me as the tree that sweetens my bitter maraz, as the rod that blossoms with life and beauty, as the brazen serpent that calls forth the look of faith. <clears throat> By the cross crucify my every sin, use it to increase my intimacy with thyself. Make it the ground of all my comfort, the liveliness of all my duties, the sum of all my gospel promises, the comfort of all my afflictions, the vigor of my love, the thankfulness, graces, and, and for the very essence of my religion. And by it, give me the, that rest, that without rest, the rest of ceaseless praise. O my Lord and Savior, thou hast appointed a cross for me to take up and carry a cross before thou givest me a crown. Thou hast appointed it to my portion, but, but self-love hates it. Cornal reasons is un unreconciled to it. Without the grace of patience, I cannot bear it. Walk with it, profit by it. O blessed cross, what mercies dost thou bring with thee? Thou art only esteemed hateful by my rebel will. Heavy because I shirk thy load. Teach me, gracious Lord and Savior, that with my cross thou sendest promised grace so that I may bear it patiently. That my cross is the yoke which is easy and thy burden which is light. Hmm. I have one question. What is M A R A H? I have no idea. I'm going to refer to Dennis. I'm looking it up. Oh. <laughs> Everybody. He is our official teacher. I'm just a stand in here. I have no idea. My bitter mirage. It would be a good thing. It, no, but it needs a tree that's sweet. Is it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Is that the name Mara? Is that the name? Because the name that name means like oh, does it? Okay. That's a really good. I wouldn't have thought of that. The only reason I know that is that the people who adopted the baby a couple years ago named her Mara, and I thought that's such a such a discouraging name for the girl. That would be like naming her Jezebel or something, right? Yes, bitter. Yeah. Uh, uh, while so, we're on that, so it means bitter. Yeah. The name. It's, I bet it. No, it can't be a positive thing. Yeah. Because the uh, the um, adjective that precedes it is bitter. Yeah. Right. It's describing whatever right. it is. It might be an old English term. I don't know. We went. So the cross, the grace of the cross. Well, uh, you could probably we could go on forever about that, but grace is exhibited in the cross. I like the last two lines. You like what? I like the last two lines. The last two lines. Because that is so hard to wrap your mind around when everything is falling apart. So let me ask you a question, um, something that I ponder a lot. So we bear our cross. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. What does that mean to you? To me? Yeah. It's life is presented to you. You just walk through carrying the, the rejoicing in the goodness and bearing the, the badness, okay. understanding that that burden still is like. But you're not carrying it on. So it represents suffering to you. <clears throat> to, to a degree. Yeah. Okay. I'm just no, I'm curious. I'm... Well, now you've got the answer. To me, what it means to me, what the cross primarily means to me is the path 
for the normal Christian is death and rebirth. Mm -hmm. And I think the cross means self-death. Now it may mean self-death. This is just my opinion now, okay? Because mm -hmm. Steve's not here, I can give, I can be heretical. But I think it means that I, you have to die to become a Christian, and then you rise rise again with Christ. So I see it as that, and I also see it like you're saying as a an ongoing burden because we have to die daily. It's not more than one time. Today. It's so I'm just curious what you thought. Yeah, because Clement, so. a Christian, he didn't lose the cross. He lost, he lost his burden. Right. It was replaced by the cross. You know what Churchill said about Charles de Gaulle? The biggest cross that I had to bear <laughs> was the cross of Louis. <laughs> so, was there any success in our hunt for the uh, just one model? It's, it's better. It's better. I mean, there's, it's all over the place. Uh, there's a Hindu meaning to it that means cheerful. <laughs> so, you know, they got it wrong. <laughs> It's well, well, unless you like bitter. <laughs> well, this one's my bitter bitterness, I guess. Any other comments? Any other comments? The ground of all my comfort, the liveliness of my duties, the sum of my gospel promises, and the very last statement: the essence of my religion, Christianity, has its foundation on the cross and the resurrection. Yeah, but do you know what? More and more. I'm thinking, rather than religion, we ought to use truth. What do you mean? Rather than religion, yes. we ought to use truth. Because religion is all over the place. Truth isn't. The truth works. Okay. Well, Paul emphasized that. He I preach Christ and Christ right. crucified. The cross. I give you what's of first importance. Yes, of what we're brethren that declare you the gospel. Yeah. All right. Anything else stand out? All right, then let's pray and uh, we'll get with our lesson today. We're going to Caesarea Philippi for uh, Peter's great confession. I believe that what this is about. So, Father, I just thank you this morning. First and foremost, I'm so glad that uh, our teacher, Dennis, is back, Father. Thank you for healing him and being with him and restoring him to us. Thank you, Father, for the teaching today that we're going to have on uh, Jesus' uh, words and uh, the great confession at Caesarea Philippi. And thank you for Dr. Sproul. And as I always, Father, I would ask that you would clear our minds, prepare our hearts uh, that this uh, teaching this morning is more than information, but it bears fruit in us. And we thank you in Jesus' name for that. Amen. Marco. All right, we're going to be uh, going to the, uh, as, as uh, Bill said, the confession uh, of Peter uh, today, as R.C. gives us his uh, take on it. There we go. Uh, Jesus did not ask this question to seek information. He was perfectly aware of what other men were calling him. What he wanted was to prepare the 12 for the question of all questions. What was their conception of him? Had he succeeding in imparting to them any understanding as to his identity and mission? They had observed him for possibly three years, but had they discerned him? That there was something unusual about Jesus was evident in their replies to his first question, but that was not enough. If the 12 shared only those popular ideas about him, then he had failed. But the time had arrived when he needed to know. And so perhaps with bated breath, Jesus put to them the supreme question, but whom do you say that I am? So that's what we're going to be looking at. Darcy is going to be discussing today. Certainly, it's clear that the central figure of the entire New Testament 
is Jesus himself. In fact, we could say he's the central figure of the entire scriptures as the Old Testament text, as the Old Testament prophets continually pointed forward to that time when he would enter into human history. Now, when we think of Jesus, we think of his name being Jesus Christ. And yet, when we stop to analyze it, we realize that that is not, properly speaking, his name, but rather it is the combination of his name and the supreme title that he bears in the New Testament. The name, or the word, Christ, corresponds to the Old Testament word, Messiah. And of all of the titles that are given to Jesus in the Scriptures, the one that ranks number one in terms of numerical frequency is the title Christ. And it is so often used in conjunction with His name that we've come to think that it is His name, Jesus Christ. But literally, what is being said with this uh, phrase is Jesus Messiah. So that in that combination of the name and the title, we find really the earliest confession of faith of the New Testament community as the New Testament church embraces Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. But when we look at the teaching of Jesus during His public ministry, something very strange emerges. What scholars of the last couple of hundred years have referred to as the messianic secret, which is found particularly in the Gospel of Mark. And what that refers to is Jesus' own hesitancy or reluctance to identify Himself with that title, Messiah. In fact, the preferred title that He uses for Himself is the title Son of Man. Now, even though the Son of Man as a title ranks third in terms of overall frequency of titles used in the New Testament for Jesus, it is far and away number one in numerical frequency in terms of Jesus' use of titles for Himself. And so, He favored the title Son of Man and seemed to shun or step away from the title Messiah. And there's been a lot of speculation as to why that was the case. And the usual solution to it was that the people in Jesus' own day were at a feverish pitch in terms of their expectation of the coming Messiah. But what they were looking for in the Messiah that they hoped for was one who would be a political revolutionary, a military leader, who perhaps would join with the zealots of the day and drive the Roman occupiers from the land and liberate the people of Israel. They were looking for a, a military leader who would come from God that they would crown as their king in this new uh, regime of independence. And Jesus, knowing this widespread distorted view of the Messiah, was extremely careful about identifying Himself with that title because it was so widely misunderstood. And so there is this element of secret or of concealment that is attached to Jesus' teaching regarding Himself. But then we get to the closing days of His public ministry where He had retreated from Judea and from the area round about Jerusalem where so much controversy had been engendered by His teaching. And it was, as it were, an occasion for Jesus to go away on retreat with His disciples. And they journeyed to Caesarea Philippi. And when He was there with His disciples at Caesarea Philippi, we have the record in Matthew's Gospel 
of a very carefully directed conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. And let's look at that, if we will. In chapter 16 of Matthew, beginning at verse 13. Now, this passage is called by various names. Most popularly, it's called the record of the Great Confession. And sometimes it's simply referred to geographically as the Caesarea <laughs> Philippi Confession. But let's look at the text in chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, Jesus is speaking now not to the multitudes or to the scribes and the Pharisees, but to his own disciples. And he's asking for uh, a report of their reconnaissance. What's the grapevine saying? What's the scuttlebutt here in the countryside? What are people saying? about my identity. Who do men say that I am? Now, I just intentionally restated Jesus' question to his disciples in an abbreviated, shortened way, because that's the way I hear it quoted all the time. When people talk about the Great Confession, they'll say Jesus came to his disciples and said, who do men say that I am? But that's not exactly what he said. If you recall from my reading of the text, Jesus said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So even here, when he's asking the question of public opinion, he identifies himself with this title, Son of Man. And so we look at the response that is given to the question. They said, some say John the Baptist, some, Eli uh, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, we recall that John the Baptist had created quite a national interest, and when he disappeared, uh, not everyone in the country knew of his fate. Certainly, Herod, after he had John the Baptist beheaded, did not uh, put it in USA Today and broadcast it to the whole land that he had murdered this very popular prophet. But John disappeared, and rumors were, were being stirred up around the countryside. And when Jesus appeared in some of the far-out villages, people had heard about John the Baptist by his fame, and they knew something of his ministry and of his message. And here Jesus is coming, saying the same thing, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So that in the popular multitudes, some people jump to the conclusion that this must be this John the Baptist that they had heard so much about. Others, still looking for the reappearance of Elijah, as was promised in the final prophecy of the Old Testament book of Malachi, identified Jesus with the uh, advent of that prophet. Others say, well, he sounds like Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So we notice that all of these designations have something in common, namely, they're all prophets. And so the public opinion that was beginning to gain in momentum was that this Jesus of Nazareth was a great prophet who had appeared. So then Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am. Now he passes from the scene of asking for a mere reporting of public opinion, and he asks them of the conclusions they had reached after being with him throughout his public ministry. And the one who responds to the question is Simon. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What he's saying here is simply this, Jesus, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. So we notice that in this brief conversation that has ensued so far, 
we have three titles attributed to Jesus. Son of Man, Christ, Son of God. Just briefly in passing, let me ask you to pay particularly close attention when you read the Gospels to the use of the phrase or the title, Son of Man. It's one of the most important titles for Jesus in the New Testament, and yet at the same time, one of the most frequently misunderstood. And part of the reason is we see the, the difference between the title Son of Man and Son of God. And given the church's confession historically of the dual nature of Jesus, that he had a divine nature and a human nature, the tendency for folks is to assume that when Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man, that he was speaking of his human nature. And when he's referred to as the Son of God, he was being referred to vis-a-vis -vis his divine nature. Well, that's, it's not as simple as all of that because both of these titles have within them elements that refer to his deity and to his humanity. But if anything, the emphasis on the two is just the opposite of what we would normally expect. The title Son of God is given in the first instance in Scripture to those who manifest obedience to the Father. Sonship is defined predominantly, not in biological terms here, but in terms of being in one accord or submissive towards and so on. Remember Jesus Himself in His discussions with the Pharisees who claimed to be sons of Abraham. Jesus rebuked him and said, you are the children of Satan. You are the children of the one whom you obey. Now, don't get me wrong. The Son of God also contains, in certain references in the New Testament, clear indications of Jesus' eternal sonship and his deity. So, we don't want to overstate the case. But this title, Son of Man, is the one I want you to really pay attention to when you're reading the Gospels because it's used so often in the New Testament, and all but three times that it occurs in the New Testament, it comes from the lips of Jesus. And it refers back to the Old Testament vision that was written down by the prophet Daniel, where Daniel had a vision into the interior of the heavenly court of God, where he saw the Ancient of Days enthroned, and the judgment was set. And to the Ancient of Days comes one like unto the Son of Man, who then is given the authority to judge the world. So that in the first instance, the Son of Man is a heavenly person, a heavenly person who descends to this world whose principal role in his visitation to this earth is that of the heavenly judge. And then he returns to the presence of God in his ascension. We remember that Jesus says, no one ascends to the Father except he who has first descended from him. Again, we tend to think that Jesus, Jesus is calling himself the Son of Man was an expression of humility, when in fact it was a claim to divine authority. That's why I want you to notice this. When uh, he heals on the Sabbath day and is rebuked by his enemies, he said, I did this that you may know that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And when he forgives sins and creates an uproar from his contemporaries saying, only God has the authority to uh, forgive sins, Jesus said, I did this that you might know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And again and again and again, you will begin to see that this title, Son of Man, that Jesus uses for himself is a highly exalted title. So when he asks the question, who do you say that I am? He had already 
refer to himself as the Son of Man. And then comes the great confession of Simon when he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, I think it's important for us to note Jesus' response to that. The first thing that he does in response to Peter's confession is to pronounce a prophetic oracle of weal upon Simon. He pronounces the divine benediction. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Now, why did he declare Simon to be in a state of blessedness? Well, he answers that question. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, that may stop us in our tracks, and we say, well, why would the recognition of Jesus as the Messiah require some kind of special assistance from God that the Holy Spirit must illumine the mind of Simon for him to recognize the true identity of Jesus. Well, again, it goes back to this concealment dimension that was so characteristic of Jesus during his earthly ministry. And we might say that people who were deeply immersed in the Old Testament Scriptures should have recognized Jesus immediately as the Messiah, but it wasn't as plain as it is to us looking at it from this side of the cross and the resurrection and the ascension and having been informed by the New Testament. For the contemporaries of Jesus, it wasn't all that clear. We remember that John the Baptist had a crisis of faith when he was thrown into prison and sent his disciples to Jesus said, are you the one who was to come or should we look for another? And we know that early on the disciples said, hey, we have found the Messiah. So that the idea of Jesus being the Messiah was not a novel thing to this inner crowd. But now, after watching him, after being with him, having all kinds of questions and confusion about what the role of the Messiah is, and Jesus asks the question, who do you say that I am? Simon doesn't hesitate. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, how blessed you are. That's not a conclusion of the flesh. But my Father has given you the eyes to see that and to understand it. And then what follows... Jesus says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So at this point, Jesus gives Simon a new name. You've made your confession, and so I'm going to name you Petros, the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he promises to give them what's called the power of the keys, the keys to the kingdom of God. This is the text that the Roman Catholic Church, of course, uh, bases its belief in the papacy because they interpret the statement of Jesus to mean that Jesus was going to build his church on Peter and that Peter and the office that he holds will be the foundational building block of the entire church. And it is said of the Pope that he holds the keys to the kingdom. That's why he can uh, <clears throat> have the power to give indulgences and so on. The Protestant interpretation of this text characteristically is that what Jesus is saying is, I'm naming you, Peter, because of the confession of faith that you've made. That's the rock 
that upon which the church is established. The chief cornerstone of the church is Christ, and it is in the embracing of Jesus as the Messiah that the church is established. And that's the way uh, historic Protestantism understands the basic thrust of this text. Well, then when we look at verse 20, we read at the end of this passage, then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Isn't that strange? Because the fundamental mission of the church is to declare to the world that Jesus is the Christ. But the immediate response to Jesus, of Jesus to this confession is, you're right, Simon, you're blessed, Simon, tell anybody. Keep it quiet. Now, what follows immediately after this is of, of crucial importance to understanding what's happening here. We read in verse 21, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Isn't that incredible? This disciple, whom Jesus had just pronounced blessed, if he is the first pope, his first action as pope is to rebuke the Son of God. And not only that, he gives a prophecy, which is a false prophecy, because he says to Jesus, far be it from you, Lord, that this shall not, then this shall not happen to you. Don't tell us that you're going to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. That can't happen. What kind of a Messiah would that be? I just declared that you're the Messiah, and now you're telling us you're going to go to Jerusalem and be killed. Now what does Jesus say? Doubly blessed are you, Simon Barjona. No, 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 no. Now he says to him, he says, he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Do you remember when we looked at the temptation of Jesus and we saw at the end of that assault of, of Satan against Christ in the desolate wilderness, that when Satan lost that battle, we were told that he departed from Christ for a season, giving us a sense of foreboding that he would be back, and here he is. And it's the same crisis. Jesus' closest disciples now become the mouthpiece of Satan, saying, it is inappropriate for the Messiah to suffer. And so Jesus said, I know where that idea comes from. Get behind me, Satan. But this event paves the way for the coming crisis of Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem, which we will begin to examine in our next segment. Any comments? Yeah, how weak we are. <laughs> I mean, we think we have faith, but boy, we really don't. It's only God that preserves that. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? I think that is the essential question for every human being. Who do you say that Christ is? The answer, like I told the Jehovah's Witnesses, the answer to that question determines your eternal destiny. There's no more important question. Who do you say Christ is? Who do you say he is? And I have to laugh because it seems to me that we're vulnerable to attacks from the evil one, either when we're depressed and we've been hit with something terrible in life, or we're riding a mountaintop of pride. 
<laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, Yeshua. I got the line to heaven. You just told me that. Now I'm going to straighten you out. <laughs> so Satan's behind, Satan puts his hand up behind Peter and he's down just doing this, right? Because of his pride, he was vulnerable for that. I always thought that about that. Because he didn't call Peter Satan. No, Peter's the puppet. And pride is the vehicle. Just a minute. Talking about the son of man, right? He thought of it like, yeah, yeah. It's all the fulfilling of the prophecies, you know. You know, even even with that, it's fulfilling something that was said in the Old Testament. Also, we do need good teachers. I would never, in my lifetime. Put this together. <laughs> I mean, by reading it and, and yeah. going back, and but I mean, it, God does gift teachers. I'm not a gifted teacher. Steve is a gifted teacher. You can put it together. But I, I mean, really, there's there's so much to learn. So much to put together. And I, that John the Baptist too. I, I wondered how they. Decided he was alive, but I guess they didn't know he was dead. Well, he pointed that out. Yeah. He didn't know it then. 600 well, miles down the line. Yeah. Just like that's what Hunter Biden. What? <laughs> what you say? Just like that's what Hunter Biden. Oh. Uh, I knew Biden would get it. This. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised no one wants to ask questions on verse 19. That is that that whole section is the foundation of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. It rests yes. on that. So the question is then, who has the keys to the kingdom of heaven? Is it Peter? How I, I don't know that heaven, I don't know enough to read that in Greek, but um, who does that refer to? It can't be Peter. God would not hand the keys to the kingdom of heaven over to Peter. I, yeah, I find it interesting. What R.C. said about uh, the Pope's first action <laughs> was to rebuke the Son of God. Now, call Satan. Yeah. Well, how, how does the Catholic Church justify all the scallywags that have been told? Do you justify what? All the scallywags that have been told. Well, I mean, they ignore the scallywags. They say to us. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they usually, especially during the Reformation period, they don't talk too much about Julius and the Popes because mm -hmm. they had mistresses, and illegitimate children, and all that stuff. In fact, that's one of the reasons that really, one of the things that upset everybody about, they should never let Luther go to Rome. Mm -hmm. That was a mistake. They tried to get him out of the way. Okay, why does Jesus warn his disciples about the teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees? In Matthew 16, 5 to 12. Well, they were wrong. They misinterpreted it. Now, let's see what Matthew. Uh, I guess the answer to that question would have to be what is the laden then for Pharisees and Sadducees? It's going to be the doctrine of the story. The doctrine of the Well, he's, I, I think early in to his, uh, his discussion, is he calls them hypocrites. And he said, You know how to discern the face of the sky after he said, If you see the sunset, you know whether it's going to rain or not um, for the next day. Um, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. You cannot discern the signs of the time. And so I think that's where he's starting this. And then he goes in to look and talks about the leaven. And uh, any other comments on that? What, what were the primary characteristics of their teaching? Legalism. Yeah. 
And how are these ideas present among us today? Well, they, they run rampant. Yeah. Such a common misconception among people of all denominations that you get to heaven by being good. I mean, yeah. I understand. Yeah, I mean, and, and the legalism extends beyond just the idea of keeping the law for salvation's sake, but there's also the idea that we keep the law, we do these things um, sort of like ensuring our rewards, you know, as opposed to uh, realizing that the rewards that we get for obeying the commandments still come from God. You know, we're not earning them still by his grace. You know, you think of all those men who are and with the Lord and everything, right? and before he has the Last Supper, they're in there saying, I'm going to be better than you. I'm going to say, <laughs> hey, can you imagine that? They're not going to be, I mean, all the, he, they've had that teaching, and they're, all, they're arguing about who's going to be the better person. Yeah. yeah. The, the whole thing of legalism tends to uh, be a part of our lives no matter what. <laughs> you know, um, I kind of think when I uh, just when you listen to to uh, advertisements commercials um, sometimes you respond as you respond to them you say oh, that's terrible you know and so you're being legalistic in a sense when you judge something you know when you judge something I, there's there's some commercials on TV that I just shut the sound off <laughs> Yeah, um, the uh, if you ever seen the Lumi commercials, Lumi commercials. This woman has created this deodorant for all parts of your body. Shut that off. I don't want to hear her. I don't want to see her. John shuts off all the all the ones where they momentarily have two guys kissing. Yeah, two ball goes to you. Anything like that, and rightly so. Anything like that. We're not discreet. No, but, but the, the fact remains that there are things that we do that are basically legalisms, you know, because we're told that the two men exchanging intimacies, yes. you know, are uh, is an abomination. It's, let's put it, it's not a holy kiss. Right. Okay. Right. And uh, so we have that legal right to say that. So we have to understand what the difference is between what the Pharisees were doing being hypocritical and how we need not to be hypocritical. So sometimes we get ourselves caught up, I think, in um, things that are not as severe as what, what that is. It's... Um, it could be the difference between somebody who is Armenian and, and, and us. And that's the essence of it. My biggest struggle in moving from Catholicism or having a background <laughs> in the foreign faith was uh, uh, to be assured of salvation mm -hmm. because salvation was so dependent upon obedience. Mm -hmm. So you can swing that pendulum both ways. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can be a legalistic or you can go into license. I, and that was a big struggle. Yeah. But there's the balance. That's what we get hooked on. There's far left and there's far right. But yeah. It's the balance. Like, um, oh, do you ever hear the left throws it to Christians that they're not loving? They're not loving enough. Mm -hmm. So we're to accept all this other stuff. And they don't, they don't have one in that side of, it, of what Christianity really is. Right. The, I'm thinking of. Uh, you know, the Covenanters for years would not vote because they did not believe that you should vote for somebody unless they were a believer. So they were now they've softened that over the years. But when I first went to the seminary, that was one of the things that they were wrestling with, whether or not you can even hold office. 
Well, you know, what do you do? You, you know, um, uh, there's a, a judge in Kansas, his name's Caleb Siegel, and he is a strong believer. He's a covenanter. Had he not entered into the political arena, he would not have gotten onto the Kansas uh, Supreme Court. And, uh, but he also was involved uh, when all those children were being held hostage after the earthquake in uh, in Haiti, he was the attorney that worked to get them released. You know, so you know we we have to watch that we don't cut our nose off to spite our face face when we're looking at things like politics. You know, what should where should we go with this? You know. Um, uh, we need to we need to be careful with that. Is that danger too? When you know when you're watching that commercial and you're turning it off or you're muting it, you're seeing two men about to whistle or whatever. A danger to, to think like as part of that, that you're better than that, better than them, right? And that, that's part of like what the Pharisees' heart was: is that we're better than you because we obey the law in the way that we think we should obey the law, rather than our heart. Behind it. The right heart behind looking at a commercial like that, and I'm convicted of this too is to say, oh, God, have mercy, save them. Because I'm no different, really, honestly, than them. I have abominations in my own heart that God has revealed to me. It's wicked. So I can't stand in judgment, right? So he has been forgiven much, should love much, right? So it's, it, there's an element of disgust, for sure. There's an element of hatred, for sure, because they're breaking God's law. But then there's the element of humility that says, oh, God, thank you, God, have mercy, and thank God, save them. That's the right heart. That's not. I'm not sure I'm there yet. I'm getting there. But I think the knee-jerk reaction is for me to think I'm better than them. In some way, in some that, way. That's you know. why you really, you got a good point there. You're not, you, you, you know, oh, I'm so and so. But we have to, in our life, find that we have to walk with God's given us. We have to make decisions. And, and like Paul says, I've already made this. I've judged what this guy, what he yes. did in the back yeah. in Corinthians. Yeah. You have to, but you but, but you could sympathize with because I, I tell you, I don't anybody see I get some of the most damn thoughts in my mind sometimes. I can yeah. stick my head in it. Yeah. And it, 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 it we're all it's a battle, and that's what he, Satan's got us, and he knows what our weaknesses. But we have a greater savior than, than Satan. He's nothing to but, but it's a battle. If you, you what I gets me is these people that stand up and they think Christianity's we're all going through the fields, you know, and the flowers. It's not, it's a battle. But he he says big, he's overcome. That's right. He can do it. But it's not easy. And if, you, if somebody comes up and starts preaching you, it's gonna be Christianity, gonna be this, and and all this love, love and love and all. Be, be aware of that. There are things that we need to avoid. I mean, as, as I'm speaking as a man, okay? Every Christian man knows that you have to train and guard your eyes. Oh, yeah. Joseph learned that with Potiphar's wife. He, yeah, he okay. realized there are certain things you can't wrestle with. You need to run from and That's what he did. And so sometimes, if not the two guys, that point is correct, okay? I mean, I wouldn't be tempted by these two guys. There's a lot of junk that comes across on the TV and that that uh, is geared or males, okay, to look at that, okay? And you have to be a little, you have to learn how to train your eyes. I'll give you an example. I, I think I've told you this before. Over in Manessa, we were working in the road in the alley, and I got in the bucket truck, and I would get my tools, and I'm going up, 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 and I go right in that point, and there's this woman sitting there. She didn't have a stitch of clothes, and she's got a cut. She looks at me, good. I look her up, and I went up, I come down, and the guy goes, hey, look what I saw up there. And it was just, oh, whatever. Oh, I'm up the box. And there he was. He's running back. You know, I, mean, I saw that. I mean, everybody, well, what am I supposed to do? He said, I never will forget that. You see some crazy things. You should forget that. You can't forget that. Well, it's like, it's like, and I said this a thousand times. So I'm redundant, but it's like I told the men's group in the church in New York. It's not a sin to see a woman and go, oh, my goodness, that woman's pretty. It's when you adjust your rear view mirror. <laughs> Therein lies the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, and getting back to what you said about Potiphar's wife, you know why he said, I fled? You know why he said, because if I stay here, sooner or later, that woman's going to seduce. He, he, he got out, he get away from And, and she did him in anyway. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Women are evil. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. It's, it's a bad. She yeah. did him in anyway. <laughs> but it was all trans. There's Jezebel's, there's Eve's, there's 
Yeah, you just made them. There's women. <laughs> I hope people listen to ask me what the takeaway was from this bottle study. <laughs> <laughs> And men, it's in the Bible, the, the, uh, the kings and all that, they're taken down by women. I mean, women never forget. You guys are really tough. It was comfortable. Well, you know, you know, I, I, you're, you know, you're not really the weaker sex in many ways, that's for sure. You know, they, you guys ask know. any man marry 55 years. Oh, yeah, he up for, he's up for oh, the best sheet of down and taking a bath. You should go home. No, I didn't. Uh, Hey, sorry. Okay. In what sense do we not dress? I'm sorry. It's all my I'm glad I have this. Yeah. Drawn back to yeah, what I promise next week I'll go to Corey's place. In, in what sense does the church prevail against the gates of hell? Speaking the truth. Okay. Is that an offensive or defensive posture? Okay. A lot of people think that's a defensive posture. We've locked the gates, so we've closed it in, and the gates of hell are banging at the door, and the door is holding it up. But it's not. That's a great way to look. I'm sorry, that's right. That's a great way to look at evangelism, by the way. You're on offense. You're going out there. You're pursuing because we're sent to go, not stay in and only preach to the choir. So. But the choir has to have good doctrine. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, choirs, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as evangelism, we're, right. we're, we're supposed to go out to the people. We're not expecting them to just come on. Hey, here, here's the other problem, too, just real quick. Evangelism is not just placing yourself somewhere and people passing by and you're reaching them. That's not biblical. You're going out, you're, you're going to them, you're meeting them where they're at. Right. Because that's the command. I think in Matthew 28, the, the way it's written is as you are going, as you are going your way and make disciples. I have. Uh, Man that has had a lot of influence on me. His name's John Perkins, and he taught. He was he was uh, in the civil rights movement. He was almost beaten to death at one point, but he has really done a lot uh, in his lifetime. He was an eighth grade in education. He's uh, been given do uh, honorary doctorates in mm -hmm. college. Mm -hmm. Just a really good, but he had he had. Uh, uh, three R's of ministry development, and I won't go into all three of them. One of them, the first one, is relocation. You have to go do the ministry. You can't. It, Jesus relocated from heaven to come here. So our example is what Jesus did. That's great. Is to be reloc uh, that's, to that's relocate. That's a great example. So um, if you ever get a chance to read any of John, look John Perkins up. He's got some great books and. Just a really, really tremendous man. Huh. It doesn't seem like when you watch the news that the gates of hell are prevailing. I mean, we know they're not. I watch the news, but when I read the scriptures, I but get a whole different. We know that, but I mean, there seems like there's no hope out there. Christianity is growing worldwide. It's just that a lot of it is happening in the third world. Or, yeah. Yeah. For instance, Iran, the Christian faith is growing. And and Iran of all places, and who's leading it? The China, 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 yeah. China. Yeah. China. Yeah. Korea has a, one of the biggest Christian populations um, in the world, well, percentage wise. We think Christianity is unique so, in America. So, so. And, and, and the idea here is not letting the news overtake our hope. Don't let the news overtake our hope. But yeah, I have four little great grandchildren. I wonder what are they going to face? Persecution. I think. I'm afraid of that. What was the one Sproul's always mentioned? I get one man went in a cave, one room collapsed. He's like, oh, oh, yeah. Jerome? Uh, Jerome? Jerome. Jerome. Yeah, yeah. Jerome. Yeah. Went in a cave. And, and uh, who was the other one? Augustine. Yeah, Augustine. Augustine. Augustine, I think. Jerome wrote a Bible. Yeah, but he he, 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 he went to But when when well, Rome fell, mm -hmm. he went to cave. Yeah, it. Who was it? It wasn't Augustine. Augustine. Who was it, Steve? I can't remember. I think it was Jerome. Yes, I know. Yeah, he did. He, he was in the cave. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because all was lost. Rome. Yeah. Was wrong. yeah. 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 So, <laughs> and there's another person that's has made tremendous inroads in, as a Christian. That's 
confronted the culture, you know, confronted what was going on. So the monastery started, by the way, because he went to the caves. It's basically the same purpose. Yeah. Not accomplishing anything. What kind of authority does the church have on earth to bind and to loose? Well, our founding fathers said there was a separation between church and state. Yeah, but see, you know here's, here's the problem. Every time you say that, our founding fathers, you're forgetting England. You're forgetting people in other countries that are Christians and don't have the founding fathers. Well, yeah, I know, but I, I relate to what we've grown up with. But the church has no business. It's to influence the government, but it is not to be the government. We right, don't according have to, to our founding fathers. According to scripture. Well, I think they answered your question. I have to ask the question, what does it mean to bind and loose? Yeah. Does it mean what? I mean, it, uh, it, it can mean to forgive sins, sins, right? Yeah. Steve is our pastor. He does not have the authority to forgive sins. He can take take us to the Lord in our repentance. And well, I mean, he, he, if I sin against him personally, he can forgive me. But we can't. I mean, that can't mean that. Mm -hmm. Now I'm probably wrong on that. The simplest thing is: Do we take who do we take the gospel to? It, it could be judgmental to say we are we are not going to take the gospel to this tribe because yeah. of their whatever. And, but we are going to take it to this. Tribe. Okay. And should we make those decisions? I don't know. That's a question. I wonder if that's not part of it. Yeah. And yet the Bible says, "Don't cast your pearls." So I, they're they're spoiling. But it's the balance of all of those. It's not doing just one thing. It's balancing the right way. But to answer your question, I don't mind the founding fathers because uh, they're an imperfect men. Well, they did a great political thing for us. Okay, well, but they were unbelievers, but they had an ethical background. I agree. Judeo-Christian. No, I mean, uh, so just because you are an unbeliever doesn't mean you can be a that you have to be a dishonest man. Yeah, that's true. I mean, Thomas Jefferson had a magnificent right. mind. Yeah. He did a great work, but he was heretical. He was he was he was cut out, cut out on what he didn't want. Well, yes. Yeah. Some of the left out. Some of the left out. I have to leave it back, so I'll get it. Um, Peter goes almost immediately from true confession to rebellion and deceit. Isn't that the way we are? You know, we can just be as, you know, we, we can sit down and share the gospel with somebody, do a great job of putting that out there, and then get down the street. And uh, uh, that's the great lure, isn't it? I think you touched on that before. It's like, you know, it, it's this element of I, I've got it here. Like whenever we seem to perceive that we've done something right for God, the temptation immediately hits you that to exalt yourself. I'm not even thinking about that. I'm thinking about the fact that we can go out and um, do something like sharing the gospel or um, helping somebody, you know, and that's just a, a, a thing to glorify God. And then the next breath after that, we can curse him. Yeah. You know, we can curse. I am so grateful for Peter because there's some of Peter and me. Like Peter saying, You're gonna die. I got you, Lord. We'll go to Jerusalem dying with you. I got your back. I'm with you, right? Okay. Well, aren't you glad God in his infinite wisdom? He's given us the Bible. He didn't give us yeah. the Bible for we're all saints. You know, we never see him. Samson, all these guys, we just just collapse. Right. So <laughs> I, I love the impulsive ambition of Peter. I really love that guy. I, I actually take I actually don't like it when people like use him as a butt of a joke in a negative way, yeah. like they're better than him or something. I'm like, bro, I I so wish I had that ambition, desire. See, what what changed with Peter after after Pentecost was that he matured, yeah. right? So he still had that same desire, but it was mature. It was more godly, it was, and uh, it it was prudent. Whereas before, it's boom, he hits the wall, boom, he hits the wall. But that's because you know, I mean, I admire that. So I see a lot of that in me, and I'm learning to be the person who's trying to be more prudent. Like, how do you keep the zeal but be mature? 
So how do you keep a zeal and still love? It's the balance. Right? It's, yeah. yeah. She, it comes to the yeah, whole I, 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 I got to go because David's going to get all upset. Where's dad? Right. <laughs> um, one of the, one yeah. of the things is... Say no, no. Uh, yeah, I will. Um, one of what things? One yeah, the things. I, I know. Um, yeah, what was that? Sorry, it must not be that important. Yes. No, don't, don't, don't get into the <laughs> No, go. Oh. Um, the significance that Peter ascribes. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I don't think that the fullness of who Jesus was was revealed to the disciples and the apostles before the resurrection. That's why in John 14, he says, I'm going to send you a comforter. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I, think, I think that the, uh, the issue is that after the resurrection, they realized what was going on. And they're, because they all went to see the grave. They all went to deal with the grave. They didn't go and say, oh, it's the three days. He must be out there. <laughs> no. And if, it, if, it, if, there, if there was no resurrection, we might as well go home. Right. And that's and that, and right. right. They, they, they had all in, but, but the grave seems to be, but when they come down, here is the Lord God. Yes. That's when. Yeah. Right. I think it's after Pentecost because there is a profound change in Peter. Yeah, after Pentecost, he was a different person than he thought. All right, here's our here's our our oh. little quiz. Oh boy! You know, I tried to do this last week, but it's a little star of David come up automatically. What did I do wrong? Oh, you weren't doing anything wrong. It was the oh. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus' full name is Jesus Christ. Yes. Yeah. False. Okay. What was the title Jesus preferred for himself? Son of Man. Well, yeah, it's the one he used the most, but yeah. not necessarily. Which of the disciples gave the Caesarea Philippi confession? Yeah. Yeah. That was a trick question. Yeah, what title for Jesus is given? Well, you know, it was Simon because it was after the confession that he became Peter. Right. What title for Jesus is given in reference to his obedience to the Father? Son of God. Yes. Which Old Testament prophet recorded the vision of the Son of Man? Jeremiah. Well, I think. It was Jeremiah. Dan? Daniel. Daniel. Ah, boy. <laughs> All right. Next week, the Transfiguration. Miss it. Well, it should be it should be recorded. I'm, I'm in the process. Of, I'm, I'm very funny. I'm, I'm getting I'm getting I'm in the process of getting caught up. I'm I have 36 in there, so I've got to do this one will be in there because it worked. I'm in it for the rest of uh and with that in mind, I just want to say this so that it gets on here in case somebody gets into goes into yes. uh, watch it on YouTube is that you can get it on YouTube, but you can also get it as as a uh, 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 a Zoom 